Hello and welcome to The Postcard Professor, where we take complex ideas and explain them in the space of a postcard. In this video, we're going to be looking at pump curves, system curves, and operating points. Let's define the problem that we're going to look at to investigate these concepts. Our goal this time around is going to be to fill a reservoir from this lake that we have down here. In order to do that, we're going to put a pump down by the lake, feed a pipe into the lake, and then have a pipe from the pump up to our reservoir. Now, we know that there is going to be energy provided by the pump, which we're going to refer to as some amount of head. That energy from the pump is going to drive our fluid through the pipe up this hill up to the reservoir. We can define that a little more clearly by talking about two separate points. Point A, which is at the surface of our lake down here, and point B, which is at the output of our pipe. Now, once we get to this point, we need to start thinking about the conservation of energy. Because this pump is providing some energy, and that energy is going to go into moving this fluid up. So, conservation of energy equation is something that we've looked at quite a few times for pipe flow. And we start with the amount of energy and the pressure. We also look at the energy due to the height, or the potential energy we look at the kinetic energy of the flow. And I'm writing this in the head formulation just because that's a little bit easier to work with. So this is all the energy that we have stored up at state A. Now to get from point A to point B, two things happen. One is that we're going to be losing some energy due to friction through this pipe. So I can write that just as our head loss due to friction. And the second is that we're going to gain some energy because this pump is going to be pushing our fluid along. And so that I'm just going to refer to as the head from our pump. And that gets us to point B. So point B is going to again have some pressure, some amounts of head, and finally, some amount of velocity. So the first step here, as always, is to just recognize the things that we can get rid of. So both at point A and point B, we're going to be exposed to atmosphere. So we can get rid of both of those values. We can also choose to set the height at A equal to zero to make this value go away. And then our height at B is just going to be the difference between these two values. Our velocity at A, because A is on the surface of our little lake or pond here, is also going to be zero. Not identically so, but it's going to be so small compared to the velocity through the pipe that we can ignore it. The height at B we know, and we don't know the velocity at B. Our next step is to take a deeper dive into the head loss due to friction. We know that this is going to be equal to the Darcy friction factor multiplied by the length of the pipe divided by the diameter of the pipe multiplied by our kinetic energy. And if we want, we can also add in our additional minor losses. So plugging that in, we can say that the head required by the pump is going to be the height at B plus the kinetic energy at B plus this entire head loss term. Now, for the sake of this problem, there's not really much going on except for the flow through the pipe itself. We don't have any bends or turns or anything like that. So I'm just going to set this equal to zero. So our equation, what we get from the conservation of energy, says that the head required by the pump is going to be composed of two parts. We have this height that we're trying to move up. And then we also have some additional amount, which is going to be based off of v squared over 2g. So we can just say that this is 1 plus fl over d 
multiplied by v squared over 2g. Now this is as far as we can get without knowing something more about the pump or about the velocity. So what we're going to do next is link up this information with the information from our pump curve. So there's a lot going on with our pump curve here, but let's start off just by looking at the two axes. So head is pretty easy. This is in feet of water, and we are working with feet of water, so things should be pretty good there already. But then our x-axis is talking about volumetric flow rate. So in order to move this into volumetric flow rate, we need to use our definition of Q, which is just velocity multiplied by the cross-sectional area of our pipe. But this is a pretty easy thing to fix. All we really need to do is modify our V squared to be equal to Q squared over A squared, and we're good to go. The next thing to note is these units. So we're talking about gallons per minute, and what we normally use for these problems is not gallons per minute, but feet cubed per second. The next thing that we want to do is to convert our gallons per minute into something that's a little bit easier to use. And it turns out that one gallon per minute is just about 0 0.00223 feet cubed per second. Now, rather than reorganize this equation to incorporate that, I'm just going to uh, write out what each of these values along the bottom are in feet cubed per second. So we have 0 0.445 as our first little tick there, and the rest is pretty straightforward. So what does this gain me? If I know the geometry of the problem, I now have a equation that I can plug into on this chart and come up with what we call a system curve. This is a curve that defines our system, the amount of head that we need to have a certain volumetric flow rate uh, to pump this water up. So at this point, let's go ahead and define our variables. Let's set the height at B equal to 40 feet. Let's make the length of the pipe 80 feet long. The diameter of the pipe is going to be four inches. We know that gravity is equal to 32.2 feet per second squared. And then that takes care of just about everything on here, except for the Darcy friction factor. So for that, if we're moving fast enough, which we can probably assume that we are, um, then the friction factor becomes about constant, which is based purely on our ratio to roughness to diameter. So we're going to assume a constant friction factor of about 0.025. So with all this defined, we have enough information to calculate the head required by the pump for a given flow rate. So let's start looking at what values we need. When Q is equal to zero, this entire thing goes away and we're just left with the 40 feet. If we increase to this first tick mark to the 0.445 feet cubed per second, then the amount of head required increases only to 42. Now, as we continue on, we're going to follow a parabolic path. So our next tick mark is at 51, 65, 85, 110, and then our final tick mark is up here at 140. Okay, so that's a good starting point. But in order to move further, we need to know what's going on with our pump curve. Well, whenever a manufacturer gives a pump curve, they typically have a family of pump curves. So what you see here is what would happen if we had different sized impellers on our pump. So the impeller is the thing that actually spins within the pump and drives the flow. So the same pump with say a 14 inch impeller would operate differently than that same pump at 13, 12, or 11 inches. But once we've chosen the size of our pump, the size of our impeller, then we could trace along and figure out exactly how much head it can provide for different flow rates. 
Now, those aren't the only curves you see on here. The other set of curves are efficiencies. So for instance, our highest efficiency may be 82%. That may be the best we can get for this pump. And then that may taper off to say 80% and then maybe 75 and so on and so forth. Now, with this family of pumps, we could choose a number of different operating points. So anywhere that our system curve crosses one of these pump curves, we could have a potential operating point. So this is simply saying that if we used this pump in the system that we've defined, then we know exactly what our flow rate is and what the head that we are overcoming is going to be, how much head that pump provides. Our goal when choosing these things is typically to choose the curve that has the highest efficiency. Our goal when choosing our operating point is typically to choose the point that has the highest efficiency. So if we visualize this family of curves as a contour plot, right, that has essentially it just viewing a hill, then we want to be as close to the top of the hill as we can be. So for instance, for this situation, we would want to be on this 14 inch impeller curve. And so we could choose that curve, end up here at our operating point, and then we can start to investigate uh, some other aspects of this system. So for instance, we know that our efficiency is right below 0 0.8. So we could say that the efficiency of our system as we're choosing to operate it is about 0 0.79. Now efficiency is of course the power out divided by the power in. And when we say power out, what we're talking about is the power supplied to the fluid. The power in is the power delivered by the motor. So our next step is to figure out how much energy we actually need in order to drive our pump. How much power, how powerful does that motor need to be? Well, we can calculate the power supplied to the fluid by using our gamma times Q times the amount of head supplied. Well, the amount of fluid flow is somewhere in the 2.1 cubic foot per second range. And the amount of head supplied is quite close to 105 feet of head. And then of course, gamma of water we can say is pretty close to 62.4 pounds per foot cubed. Multiplying those things together gets us 13,759 pounds feet per second. And then if we want to convert that into horsepower, all we have to do is divide by 550 and we end up with right at 25 horsepower. Now this is the power supplied by the pump. In order to find the power delivered by the motor, we just say that P in is equal to P out divided by our efficiency. And we end up with an input energy of 31.7 horsepower. So just to recap, we use the conservation of energy equation to investigate our system to start. However, whenever we did that, we got to a point where we had two unknowns and only one equation. We didn't know what the head delivered by the pump was, nor did we know what the velocity through our pipe was. So in order to move forward, we needed to look at our pump curve. To figure out exactly how we were operating, we just plotted our system curve on top of these pump curves and then chose the diameter of the impeller that we wanted. Once we have the operating points, that's enough to say exactly how much fluid is moving through the system and how much head is actually being supplied by the pump. 
With those two pieces of information, we can go investigate some other things. We can see exactly how much power is delivered by the pump. And with that information as well, along with the efficiency, we can see how much power is required by the motor to actually drive the pump to do what we need. So this was an example of how to use pump curves alongside a system that we know in order to determine the operating points.